Good morning, everyone. It is two minutes to 10.30, so let us take this two minutes advantage. And uh, can I call the panel, uh, Dr. Kim Ramasamy? Can you join me on the dais? Dr. Vishali Gupta. Dr. Ajay Arora. Dr. Subendu Boral. Please come and join me. And uh, this is mainly regarding the diabetic retinopathy and uh, it's very, very important topic as such. And um, we have uh, very well-known and uh, academically well-oriented speakers so that uh, we can utilize the best of uh, whatever possible in diabetic retinopathy. And we have uh, 10 minutes for each speaker and maybe if time permits, we will ask the questions. And if they finish early, then that extra time we can utilize for discussion. And we have uh, one uh, keynote address. Dr. Niaz, you want to go first or shall we go with Dr. Kim? Yeah. So Dr. Niaz is uh, from Bangladesh. He is very well experienced VR surgeon. Can we have the slides of Dr. Niaz, please? Yeah. He is from uh, Bangladesh uh, Hospital, which is a major hospital in um, Bangladesh with a lot of branches, almost nine branches. And a lot of people from the, the same hospital, they are here and they regularly attend uh, All India Ophthalmological Society conferences and we are very thankful for that. And um, without wasting much time, I request Dr. Niaz to deliver his lecture. That will be for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajit Babu. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity, especially uh, the Scientific Secretary Partho Bishash and Namrata Sharma, the General Secretary. Well, I'm going to, in this uh, session, I'm going to just talk about, although it's surgical, I'll just give you a few surgical pearls on diabetic vitrectomy. To start off, with, I'd like to say that in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, Vitrectomy allows the removal of media opacities, offer relief from traction, vitreoretinal traction, and most importantly, removes the fibrovascular tissue and the scaffold for the fibrovascular tissue to anchor. This is the most important part. If this, the posterior hyaloid is removed, the vitreous is removed, then the eye is safe and it doesn't go into uh, progress into blindness. In addition, preoperatively, if you give PRP laser, or you give anti-VEGF, uh, the eye gets stabilized for in the vasoproliferative proliferative process. And we must know that although visual outcomes vary, but most patients benefit from this procedure. Now, one point of note is that sometimes we think that after giving a PRP, uh, that is the gold standard and the eye is safe, but actually it's not so. Because despite adequate laser treatment, many will eventually go into uh, proliferative stages, more proliferation will occur as you see in the angiogram after PRP membranes have developed. So uh, we have to be careful about that and we have to keep on seeing the patients and uh, do surgery. You see, in, in this particular case, this patient came to us in 2014, a frank case, case of PDR. The patient was lost, didn't do any treatment. After two years, the membranes have formed and went into blindness uh, eventually if nothing is done. So we must remember that we must intervene early. And in 2014, if a vitrectomy could have been done or a good laser could have been done, then we could have avoided a uh, 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 blindness in this case. If you look at this, this picture, you see there was uh, bleeding, pre-retinal hemorrhage spread all over the posterior pole, but you can uh, visualize the intact posterior hyaluronic face uh, over there, and surgery in this case was easy, just removing the posterior hyaluronic face, flushing out the blood, and as the macula was not involved, traction was not there, the eye is fine, and the patient has very good vision. So intervention should be done uh, before, before tractions are there, before the retina gets detached. 
In a case like this, where in 2000, in, in January, the patient came with bleeding like this, and then in a couple of months, there was breakthrough. And now uh, the uh, view is absolutely lost. B scan was done, I can, we could see that there is a PVD, but there was blood not only in front, but also behind. So in a case like this, this is a normal scenario in, in dense vitreous hemorrhages. We don't know where the retina is. We don't know where attractions are. And to avoid injuring the retina, you do a central vitrectomy and try to locate the posterior hyaloid and make a small opening in the posterior hyaloid. Once that is done, we try to uh, suck out the blood, uh, aspirate the subretinal blood. As this is being done, gradually the view of the retina becomes apparent. You can see the red glow and then you can see the retina. Once you've seen the retina, you're home because now you can safely do the surgery and prevent any kind of surgical mishaps to the retina. But diabetic vitrectomy is all about membranes. If you look at this picture, when the um, new vessels form, the new vessels are uh, on the surface of the retina. And gradually the new vessels, what happens is there is fibrovascular uh, 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 tissue uh, proliferation and it becomes the fibrovascular membrane. And this membrane sticks to the posterior hyaloid face and once there is uh, a PVD, then, then what happens as it is anchored to the retinal blood vessels, you start having a uh, traction retinal detachment. Now, if you look from the side view, you can understand the pathoanatomy. And this is what surgeons must be aware of and understand where to dissect the posterior hyaloid and leave the anchoring over there so that you allow the retina to uh, fall back and how to get, get into the planes. Getting into the plane is the most important thing, finding the planes and do a successful surgery. Now, uh, this, look at this case. There was extensive fibrovascular membrane. Preoperatively, anti was given. The blood vessels have regressed, and now it's a case of pulling out the, uh, doing a vitrectomy and and uh, uh, pulling out the membrane. The membrane was attached. There were little tags. One was at the macula, as you can see over here. Once you see a tag like that, instead of really pulling it, you can slightly dissect the tag, and so that the underlying retina is not detached and you to make a hole in the retina. If there are places where the, <coughs> excuse me, where the uh, attachment is very strong, you can go around and leave a little stump uh, 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 and prevent the membrane. Here you see I've got the plane and, and after dissecting, uh, we release the traction, the bridging traction. And here there, there was a, a, a stronger addition. So we went all around and left a little stump over there and, and prevented injury to the retina. So like, like so, you see, we left a left little stump and, and then the membrane uh, was easily taken off, the whole membrane. And uh, postoperatively, this is what the case looked like. There was a, a little tear over there, but it was on the nasal side. But the patient has reasonably good vision because the whole membrane was removed. The eye is safe. Bleeders are very important in these cases. Uh, our desire is to have a bloodless surgery. To do that preoperatively, we can give anti-VGFs, but uh, peroperatively, if we have bleeders, we have to control them early. We should not leave them so, so that you know our view is obscured. I initially, if there's a small bleeder, you can increase the IOP for a few minutes and see whether it goes down. If it doesn't, you can use direct manual pressure by the tip of your cutter or a blunt instrument, hold it to the bleeding point for a minute or so, and most of the time the, the, it coagulates and the bleeding stops. And at the last resort is diathermy. We have to be very careful with diathermy because diathermy can also injure the retina. Uh, sometimes we get a combined detachment where the traction is such that you, we have a tear like here. So it's a regmatogenous component plus the traction component. In these cases, uh, we have to be very gently, we have to remove the whole posterior hyaloid phase and the vitreous, but the underlying retina can be very fragile and a little bit of traction can lead to further tears. We have to be very careful that we don't tear in the macular region. If it is the nasal region, it is fine. So gradually we remove all the vitreous at all the all the tra uh, traction elements and all the fibrovascular elements, if it is done, then a straightforward air fluid exchange, laser, and a tamponade 
could uh, settle down the retina. Sometimes the membranes are very, very thin. If the membranes are very thin, then getting the plane and understanding the plane is very important. Over here, uh, uh, with the new cutters, where the, where the opening is very near the tip, and the, uh, things have become much easier and much safer. We can use the new cutters to gradually find the plane and lift the posterior hyaloid face. And once the posterior hyaloid face is lifted up, uh, dissect the whole retina and prevent uh, too much traction so that you don't have many tears. There, you are bound to have one or two tears in most of these cases, a small tear. That is acceptable because uh, with the laser and a little bit of tamponade, even if it's gas, the retina settles down. You just have to be careful that the tear is not in a very strategic position. So uh, with the new instruments and the new parameters in the new vitrectomy machines, the surgery has become uh, much easier than what it used to be 20 years ago. And now most of us can do uh, a very good surgery in these cases. Sometimes the additions are very strong. And we know that uh, in the normal way that we do, it will be very difficult to uh, save the, you know, do a successful surgery without injuring the retina. If preoperatively we, can, we come across a case, we plan for a bimanual surgery. Here you can see I've put in two chandelier lights and, and in one hand I've got a forcep, the other hand is my cutter. And with the forcep I'm lifting the retina, which has very strong additions underneath. And gradually with the cutter I'm releasing the traction uh, under, underneath so that the retina is safe and we don't make a tear in the retina. So that is the beauty of bimanual surgery and it can, uh, at times it really uh, can uh, help us. So therefore, my time is running out. So friends, in a case like this, a good surgery, we can restore our eye like that. Uh, and uh, the newer technological advances, 3D viewing surgery, this very high resolution, very good depth of focus, and it can really help you uh, see better. And it is, uh, if you have one, you can try it out. So friends, we have to be bold and timing is very important. We have to act very quickly to save these eyes. That is the pearl that I want to give. Don't wait too long, act quickly. Thank you very much. Dr. Niaz, um, that was a wonderful talk. And we have another talk at the end of the session. So we will discuss both the things together. Now, without wasting much time, um, I will go on to the our first speaker of the session, that is uh, Dr. Kim Ramasamy. He will be talking about the systemic parameters and management of uh, diabetic retinopathy in relation to systemic parameters. If you see the diabetes, it's a systemic disease which manifests in the eye. So understanding the systems is very, very essential. And we will not get another best speaker to talk about it. And Dr. Kim Ramasamy will be handling this. Dr. Kim. Retinopathy. As uh, Dr. Ajit Babu said, this is uh, not exclusively for retina specialists anymore with the number of diabetic patients around. It's every single ophthalmologist has to play a role in the management of diabetic retinopathy. We all know this number, the last, this uh, International Diabetes Federation which brought out showed that the prevalence of diabetes was 537 earlier. We were looking at it as 467. And the recent data shows the number is quite high, which means we are facing with a lot of diabetic population in the world, more so in a country like India. This was a study done, uh, a multicentric study uh, called uh, Ornate uh, India Study, where we looked at the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy among the population, uh, both in the urban and local area. And this was done across 10 states in, in India, across India which showed that the overall prevalence of diabetic retinopathy above the age of 40 was around 12.5%. More importantly, it showed that the sight-threatening retinopathy was 4%, which is really, really huge. We are losing patients to diabetic retinopathy at a much faster rate than we can manage. So I'm going to res uh, restrict my talk to the systemic parameters, briefly touching on this. 
We know that there are quite a few rhythmic factors. Uh, the more non-modifiable are pregnancy, puberty. Modifiable factors such as hyperglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, and there are various other factors. And there are enough evidence to show that these are the risk factors which affect the uh, progression of diabetic retinopathy. So, to focus on this and how do we manage this. Duration of diabetic retinopathy is very is uh, one important. The VSTR, the Wisconsin Epidemiological Study, had already shown quite some time back that duration is the strongest predictor of the development and progression of DR. So, if you see the duration of diabetes more than 20 years, the chance of developing any retinopathy is 80 percent in spite of going a good inter, good uh, diabetic control. Gender, they say male proportionately has a higher prevalence of uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, uh, than, than women. Prevalence of diabetic retinopathy, uh, including the sight-threatening or the vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy, is increases with the age. As we know, the duration is an is a important factor. And earlier it was thought it was much higher in the, in the urban population, but it was seen in this study done by all of us that this is similar both in the urban and in the rural population. Unfortunately, in the rural population, we do not have access to care for many patients. There, there is uh, the lack of ophthalmologists in this area. So these are because they're mostly concentrated in the urban areas. So we have to realize that this prevalence is much higher, be it if the patient is from the urban or even in the rural areas. One important factor, we all know that glycemia is a, is a very important risk factor uh, for diabetic retinopathy progression. In spite of intensive glycemic control, it has been shown that the progression of diabetic retinopathy is markedly reduced when compared to the standard treatment or standard management of glycemia. And more importantly, it is found to have a persistent effect on diabetic retinopathy progression, wherein the prior intensive control continues to have late benefits even after years of withdrawal of intensive control. The earlier you institute the intensive diabetic control, the earlier you prevent any advanced stages of diabetic retinopathy coming in. The Chennai Urban Rural uh, study done by the Mohan's Diabetic Center showed that every 2% elevation in HbA1c, the risk of diabetic retinopathy is increased by a factor of 1.71. As it said, there are enough trials, clinical trials, which have shown that the microvascular changes is markedly reduced as far as the, the microvascular changes as in the eye and in nephropathy is markedly reduced. Uh, and uh, in macro, uh, retina, macrovascular changes, there is a moderate uh, in, role in, in uh, controlling the diabetic, uh, the glycemic control. This was another study done by the Mohan's group, which said to assess the relationship between the regularity of follow-up and the risk of complications in patients with type 2 diabetes. They were followed for up to nine years at the tertiary center, and they found that with pa in patients with type 2 diabetes, regular follow-up was associated with significant lower glycemic burden and lower incidence of retinopathy and nephropathy over this nine year period. So it clearly showed that following up these patients very closely helped in reducing the chances of damaging the retina or the kidneys. Blood pressure control, of course, we all know that it also plays a major role in the progression of diabetic retinopathy. The better you control, the better. There are enough evidences to show that. Another important factor is the risk factor is the serum lipids. When there is a lot of hard oxidates associated, especially in diabetic macular edema, high serum total cholesterol is associated with higher prevalence of hard oxidates in both younger and older onset group patients. And higher level of serum lipids were associated with increased risk of hard oxidates in the macula. Dr. Amod Gupta from PGI had clearly shown that the controlling this lipids helps in reducing the uh, hard exudates in the macular area where oral atrovastatin therapy in patients with type 2 
diabetes with dyslipidemia reduces the severity of heart exudates and subfoveal lipid migration in the in the uh, patients with diabetic macular edema what about kidneys we know both uh, the uh, vascular changes the microvascular changes that affects the retina the same problem happens even in the kidneys they are with patients with microalbuminuria around two times as likely to have diabetic retinopathy as those without microalbuminuria and then in the presence of macroalbuminuria the risk is almost six times diabetic kidney disease at baseline is another important risk factor for the progression to sight threatening patients who have diabetic kidney disease are likely to have advanced diabetic retinopathy or vision threatening retinopathy pregnancy as we know is a is a definitely a risk factor especially pregnancy in patients who are known diabetics they have to be extra careful because of the high levels of estrogen and other hormones that increase during this period can cause the progression of retinopathy and it's been noticed that patients diabetic patients who are becoming pregnant are more likely to develop diabetic retinopathy and progression compared to people of the same age without diabetic retina diabetes uh, but in a women with who begin a pregnancy with no evidence of retinopathy the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy is about 10% and it is important that these diabetic women should be counseled regarding the effect of pregnancy on retinopathy as we know that those who have uh, diabetic changes especially advanced diabetic changes like sight threatening or vision threatening or severe npdr should be treated first before they are they even go into uh, conception they should be warned about that and they should be examined very closely in their first trimester of pregnancy anemia is another important factor where uh, the diabetic retinopathy uh, can worsen uh, anemia can lead to if you have Uh, a, a low hba1c levels with low anemia because uh, with anemia the patients are likely to be missed and uh, so you have to make sure you check the hemoglobin levels of these patients and then only take in the hba1c levels for further assessment so we know that anemia is an independent risk factor can cause damage uh, and by correcting that you can improve the diabetic retinopathy status another condition the impact of diabetic retinopathy and cardiac outcome on coronary see, patients who are undergoing capg uh, the overall presence of retinopathy is definitely a strong risk factor for all cause mortality for patients undergoing capg the 12 year overall survival rate has been shown as only 40% in diabetics with retinopathy while in the those without retinopathy it is 80% so we did a study here at arvin to look at this with one of the cardiologists uh, to assess the impact of diabetic retinopathy on on the out cardiac outcome after coronary artery bypass so these patients about 126 patients were observed over a period of time uh, their baseline uh, retinopathy or re diabetic retinal status was measured and was clearly seen in those patients with retinopathy the non fatal myocardial uh, infarction or the congestive heart failure was much higher in relation to patients who did not have retinopathy at baseline when they did the capg so they had adverse events and the 18 month follow up of our study showed that advanced cardiac events were reported in 65% of the patients uh, who had diabetic retinopathy so what is important is how well are these patients controlled in our study today we have a very poor control the reason is one we all focus on diabetic retinopathy as a condition but do how much do we to look at the systemic status of the patient it is important that every ophthalmologist talks to the diabetologist i mean their physicians or diabetologists to ensure that their patients that they are treating is well controlled for all these risk factors Uh, as they continue the treatment otherwise your your uh, prognosis is going to be very poor thank you thank you dr kim if uh, see lot of uh, general ophthalmologists in the audience you can ask one question to dr kim but what a, a guideline i give is that whenever the patient is coming 
first time you are encountering with any patient of diabetic retinopathy, you should subject them for systemic evaluation. We always complain that the physicians do not investigate, but we also don't investigate. That is number one. Number two is the diabetic macular edema patient who is non-responding to all the agents or the lasers. Again, you should go for investigation, systemic detailed investigation should be done. And in proliferative diabetic retinopathy or any diabetic retinopathy stage which is progressing in spite of your best efforts, again, systemic parameter evaluation and control is very, very essential. With this short uh, note, we will uh, again proceed for the next talk. So, the uh, second part, you want to ask some question, please. When a patient of diabetic retinopathy with moderate, uh, severe or uh, PDR comes, I just, I don't look at the eye, the pallor, I look at his hand. Because he might be having uh, instilled phenylephrine that will mask the, the cause more of pallor. Looking at the hand will help us a lot. No, not only hands, you should see the legs also. He has not put uh, de dealt with the diabetic feet, but it's very, very frequent diabetic uh, foot uh, neuropathies, mainly uh, peripheral neuropathies, which can cause diabetic feet uh, manifestations. So we need to be more physicians. We should not forget what we have learned during our MBBS. That is very, very essential. Now I will go on to the diabetic retinopathy, the clinical features, because a lot of other diseases may mimic uh, diabetic retinopathy, but we should understand what stays really these eye interventions, ophthalmic interventions. I will not now touch upon much about the systemic intervention, but eye interventions which may be required. So we should always understand that we are, whether retina specialist, medical retina specialist or uh, general ophthalmologist, we shall be able to deal with diabetes because it is an epidemic which is going on and our country is in the highest uh, uh, prevalence of diabetic retinopathy and almost all the diabetics, if you see, 35% are involved with some form of diabetic retinopathy. You cannot escape from managing diabetic retinopathy. That is one dictum I tell you. And you need to see there are three major uh, stages which you need to identify. That is proliferative diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, and sight threatening. Means both can contribute and it is almost up to the tune of 11%. Now, though the early house classification is very, very old, it has given the posterior pole very much importance and we need to see these seven pictures. And the macular area, especially this grid is very essential. If you see the rings, the central most is 300 microns and then the solid line is 500 microns. After that one disc area, the one disc diameter and 300 microns is very, very essential in your clinic to decide what treatment is applicable for these patients. So when you say it is not the classification actually, it is the severity of diabetic retinopathy. From no diabetic retinopathy to very severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you should stay in your mind. This patient is reached this stage. So this requires this intervention. That is very, very essential. So you need to identify mild not proliferative, moderate, severe, and I will come to very severe diabetic retinopathy as well and the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So whenever you are dealing with diabetic retinopathy, there are few signs you should always look for. And one classic sign is microaneurysm, which is the earliest sign. Though the vascular changes are described in the textbook as the earliest diabetic retinopathy signs, probably in the clinic you may not be able to identify. The number of intraretinal hemorrhages is again a very important aspect. The hard exudate formation shows that there is some kind of leaking activity which can happen with diabetic retinopathy. And cotton wool spots, though not given so much of importance, they indicate localized areas of capillary non-perfusion. So whenever you are seeing either color fundus photograph or an angiography or a red-free photograph, you should be able to look for 
which are the signs and what is the stage this patient is of diabetic retinopathy. So let us go back to the, our textbooks like ETDRS classification. If you see, they have given different stages of disease progression. Even the number of retinal hemorrhages, they have given lot of importance. So very mild, you are seeing hardly any retinal hemorrhages there. And uh, the second stage where uh, moderate uh, retinal hemorrhages, again, the second picture is showing. When it comes to severe retinal hemorrhages, if in the clinic, even as a medical retina or a general ophthalmologist, you can count the number of retinal hemorrhages in a given quadrant. If it is crossing 20, anyone can count more than 20, you can easily count and you say this is a severe retinal hemorrhages. And this is another sign which you should always look for is venous bleeding. In this again, early venous bleeding is very, very mild and it can be uh, easily missed. You should identify that. So you can see the venous bleeding in the nasal side, especially in two quadrants, it's almost uh, a different stage. And Irma is another lesion which we need to be very, very well versed with because these are again shows signs of uh, severe form of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And hard exudates, it can be part of non-proliferative or there can be a simultaneous association between maculopathy and either non-proliferative or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Maculopathy can be associated with both. So it can fit into any stage of uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy. And here you can see almost CSM is present there. So why this is important that severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or very severe is um, uh, need to be identified. So we have given three uh, points. One is intraretinal hemorrhages of severe nature. You need to identify the 20 retinal hemorrhages in a one quadrant. That you need to remember. Any general ophthalmologist can also assess. Venous bleeding you should be able to identify and if it is present in two quadrants, or moderate to severe IRMA, which I again shown you in at least one quadrant. If any one of them is present, it is severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, very simple staging. This, if two are there, then it is very severe. So it's important to stage non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it is in the clinic. Why it is important here? You see in one year, if it is very severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, half of the patients are going into proliferative diabetic retinopathy and if you are missing these patients, then they can bleed and then severe complications can happen. So you need to pick the patients at this stage. Now let us temporarily go on to the diabetic maculopathy. It can again be a mild non uh, diabetic macular edema, moderate diabetic macular edema, or severe diabetic macular edema, depending upon how much the center of the macula is getting affected. And here again, you always see for exudates, but it is the retinal thickening, which is very important sign and which can be picked up only by slit lamp by microscopy with 90D examination. So you should be well versed with that examination. And ETDRS clearly uh, defined the clinically significant macular edema, which means that this patient has risk of losing vision if you leave these patients untreated. Then in the clinic, you should not only uh, concentrate on diabetic macular edema. There are other forms of diabetic maculopathy. Either it could be a cystoid macular edema or focal macular edema, ischemic maculopathy, or a combined diffuse and uh, focal uh, uh, cystoid macular edema or ischemic maculopathy with uh, cystoid or with traction. So you need to identify this because the treatment or the management strategy differs with these patients. So this is an example of uh, ischemic maculopathy. And OCT again, you can utilize to the maximum extent to type 5 ward diabetic macular uh, you are dealing with. And if you see the staging, the international uh, staging for diabetic retinopathy CVRT is different from ETDRS in that 
if you see the severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it again identified as two different, one severe and second is very severe. Whereas in proliferative, again, they stage differently in early, high risk and severe diabetic retinopathy. Can you identify any lesion here? At what stage it is? It's an early PDR and that is a uh, neovascular, uh, retinal neovascularization. This is a little bit more severe uh, stage of proliferative. Again, still a little bit more. So it is like high risk with complications. And this is like subhyoid hemorrhage and very severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy where the interventions can be very tough. So if you want to stage for a study purpose, again, you should follow this staging and the levels. With this, I would conclude that uh, in the clinic, diabetic retinopathy should be staged so that your treatment regimen can be addressed towards that stage. Thank you. Now, uh, can uh, Dr. Vishali be ready for the next talk? And uh, if any questions are there, I'm uh, happy to address that. In case of a very severe systemic disease in a diabetic patient undergoing a <clears throat> dialysis and patient cannot go for transplant and the patient is being treated for a long time. So if the patient develops severe diabetic macular edema or advanced diabetic retinopathy proliferative, what is your take in management and if you want to give antifazep, which antifazep would you prefer? Yeah, I think uh, Rajiv Raman's talk is there for that, but uh, we have, uh, what I would suggest is, whatever ocular treatment you are giving is a temporary, a temporary solace, because severe nephropathy, these patients tend to have the risk of accumulation of the fluid in the macular area. So treatment for a severe nephropathy is re renal transplantation. Unfortunately, in our country, the waiting period for renal transplant is very high. So temporarily, you need to maintain the uh, retina, uh, macular thickness to maintain the vision so that we should not lose whatever uh, clinical uh, uh, the potential, visual potential the patient is having. Regarding the anti what would you prefer if you want to keep? That is your preference rather than my preference. Any, no, no, any anti or we are dealing with that actually. The talk is there. That's why I don't want to answer that right okay. now. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr. Babu. Dr. Vishali, uh, you can continue. You know, your uh, the topic that has been given to me is the diagnostic evaluation of diabetic retinopathy and DME. So far, Dr. Babu explained it beautifully that when you look at the fundus, you need to first characterize whether it is a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or there is a proliferation of abnormal vessels. Now let's go step by step. You have done your fundoscopy and you know it's non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which could be very early or which could be more advanced like moderate. The first question that one should be answering is, is there an associated macular edema? So for that, the only investigation that helps you answer the question straight away is the OCT. OCT, simple line scan, are a cube, but the line scan, if you are uh, analyzing, it should be passing through the fovea. Now you look at the OCT and you do understand there is macular edema. When you look at the macular edema, just look if there is any traction or not. If there is a traction, don't try to think of the medical management. Now if there is no traction, which is so obvious on OCT, 
the next question to answer is is it center involving or is it not involving the center because if it is center involving macular edema it will require anti vgf therapy but if it is not center involving therapy in macular edema you might be able to get away with simple focal laser and does not require repeat injections so now let's assume it's a non center involving what should be done next the next is to look are there any microaneurysms yes there are microaneurysms which are away from the center which you feel you can do laser then now here comes the role of the angiogram you do a fluorescein angiogram to document those microaneurysms because you want to be very sure what are the areas that you are leaking for so the fluorescein is not required to make the diagnosis of macular edema but it is important to identify the treatable lesions in case you decide to go ahead with laser photocoagulation there comes another thing all our lives we have been told to focus on the posterior pole because we always thought that the diabetes involves the posterior pole and we would not even bother to look at the periphery but not any more with the wide field your posterior pole apparently might show you know it's okay it's uh, npdr but if you are seeing any occluded vessels any areas which are suspicious in the periphery please do not believe it could not be pdr it's important to do an angiogram and you would realize that if you look only at the posterior pole it's kind of severe npdr with macular edema but when you look at the periphery there are changes happening in the periphery so fluorescein is going to help you identify the new vessels whenever you are in doubt uh, dr babu showed beautiful armas but it's not always very easy to differentiate an arma for nve so whenever in doubt the fluorescein would be required to answer some of these questions so here is a simple algorithm for non proliferative diabetic retinopathy if it is mild to moderate check if there is macular edema you can up to this point actually you can do clinically uh, but you can take the help of oct just to say if you think macular edema either is present or you are not sure it's it's fine not to be sure you are just suspecting do an oct oct shows center involvement it's good idea for injections oct shows non center involvement you are planning focal laser please do a fluorescein before focal laser if it is severe npdr and you are not very sure that you can see nve it's always a good idea to go ahead with fluorescein angiogram and of course oct along with it to look for macular edema when we come to proliferative diabetic retinopathy most of the time it's on our face for example you have these huge pre retinal bleeds or something so you would know it's proliferative but sometimes what happens this patient look like this at presentation and when you look at the presentation your macular edema is very overwhelming but there is a fine nvd which was missed at some level so please pay an attention clinically and if not sure get an angiogram done because this patient at this point of time required treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy but the very fact that he was labeled as severe npdr with macular edema and sent for systemic control including lipid lowering and all he comes up like this 50% of these patients with very severe npdr would progress to pdr in one year so in severe npdr it's important to look for the features and sometimes you uh, you know look at the retina for example this retina is not looking good multiple cotton wood spots kind of ischemic looking and you are not able to clinically be very sure whether it is npdr severe are proliferative 
And these are the cases which will end up in vitreous hemorrhage. But if you do fluorescein, you would realize there is lots going on uh, with capillary non-perfusion. And this patient needs uh, good early management. Now, we have uh, covered both the NPDR and NP, uh, PTR. Now, OCT shows macular edema, and I'm going to just go in passing, what do you look for? Besides the traction, non-traction, macular thickness, there are a couple of things which comprehensive ophthalmologists can pay attention to. And first of them is drill. Drill is nothing but when you see the inner retinal layers are disorganized, for example, you see here, you don't see them separately. It simply means that patient may not have a very good visual recovery following your anti-VEGF injection. So you can counsel the patient regarding that. This is what a magnified view of drill is. Sometimes you see such huge spaces that the outer retina, this is the external limiting membrane, and you see it's all disrupted. Again, if this is disrupted, don't be tempted to put more laser. You see already somebody has done a lot of laser. Don't put more laser because these are the kind of the patients who are not going to improve vision. So make a conscious decision and counseling with the patient before pumping more anti-VEGFs. Hyperreflective foci, you will see many retina people talking about these, these hyperreflective dots, which can be easily seen by anybody. You don't need a retina expert to look at these hyperreflective dots. These dots basically means especially if they are associated with this kind of serious detachment means inflammation is playing a very important role and anti-VGFs may not work and you may need to switch over to steroids early in the course of the disease or seek the help of your retina colleagues. Same is the situation with subfoveal serous detachment especially if it is coming after your colleague has performed a cataract surgery. These are the kind of the patients who would respond better to steroids than to anti-VGFs. Pre-retinal bleed, you don't have to do anything. Just go ahead with the management of PDR. Advanced tractional detachment, no role of angiograms, ROCTs. Just refer it to your retina colleagues for, uh, you know, uh, treatment. And lastly, if you are seeing NVDs like this, these kind of NVDs, don't waste your time on angiograms because while you are waiting for angiograms a couple of weeks are referring, patient might end up with a bleed. So these are the kind of the situations like even if you do angiogram, it doesn't give you information. There is NVD. It needs to be managed by angiogram, you know. So some of these situations need to be managed. NVE, you are seeing a straightforward NVE, no need for angiogram. You are not sure, as I showed earlier, please go ahead with the angiogram. So whenever in doubt, for example, this patient, very fine NVD, you are not sure, angiogram to confirm. So to conclude, the diagnosis of di diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy is primarily clinical, and Dr. Babu has shown a beautiful presentation how to diagnose it clinically. FFA, OCT are the two main imaging modalities, but everything doesn't have to be done in every diabetic patient. So you have to characterize the diabetes and then do what is required for the patient. And please note that fluorescein is not a modality to follow up your patients. It's just initially when in doubt, but you don't follow it up on fluorescein and repeatedly. These are not required to make the diagnosis, only in some treatment uh, decision making. So they should be used as and when required. Thank you very much, Dr. Babu, once again, for the very kind Thank opportunity. You. Thank you, Dr. Vishali. Are there any questions for Dr. Vishali regarding the diagnostics in diabetic retinopathy? I request Dr. Ajay Arora to be ready for the presentation. Uh, yeah. We have Dr. Not Vishali, fantastic uh, talk. An OCT of traction. 
VMT, Vitamacular uh. Traction or there's... If, if yeah, that, that is what I said the first thing. I forgot actually to put the OCT. One that once we do the OCT, the, what we have to dis decide is, is it a tractional variety or non-tractional variety? The tractional variety is going to show you the pull on the fovea. If it is a tractional variety, please do not do any injection or laser. Just refer it to the vitro retina colleague. If it is non-tractional, that is what I have shown, the non-tractional variety of macular edema. Then you see center involving, non-center involving, and go ahead. Okay, next. Yeah, yeah uh, Dr. Vishali, very good talk. Thank you. Just two questions for you. One is that in, in doubtful cases of severe NPDR, where you are suspecting a proliferative disease, you said one of the best treatment modalities or investigative modalities has to be an FFA to confirm the proliferative. Sometimes we have seen that the retinal vasculature, the retinal veins are actually more dilated in the quadrant where the NV is eventually going to be located. So could that be one of the findings or one of the signs where you can actually suspect that there is a probable neovascularization in a patient with PDR? That's my first question. And second, is there a difference between a neovascularization arising from the disc vessels, that is the NVD, and a peripapillary retinal neovascularization. Is there a difference between these two entities or both are the same? Answering the second question first, the definition of NVD is any new vascularization arising from the disc or within one diameter of the disc. So the peripapillary is automatically covered in the definition of NVD. So everything becomes NVD. Now coming to first question that when we look at the AV ratio, what essentially you are talking about, does it give us a clue about the overall health? That's a beautiful subject and uh, actually we are presenting a paper here also where we are meeting it automated. Like instead of you saying two is to three and me saying one is to two, we have, we are developing an algorithm called retinal health index. So it's semi-automated. You do it, it gives you a value that this is the health. We have not tried it in diabetics, but in BRVO patients, it shows even in the opposite eye, the AV ratio is altered compared to the normal controls. But I think very soon we will have these kind of algorithms. But if you are suspecting, please go ahead and do angiogram. There is no harm. Yeah, but in the clinic, especially for a general ophthalmologist, to concentrate on venous dilatation to identify yeah. the neovascularization is not a good suggestion. Yeah. I but always consider uh, me as a general ophthalmologist in the clinic not missing severe stages of diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema. So vision threatening diabetic retinopathy is one which they should identify early and send to the retina specialist. That is my target. Okay, quick question from me. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for the presentation. Ma'am, uh, you showed that image of drill. Ma'am, uh, we had that lesion in the parafoveal area. So if it is present there, would it still have a bad prognosis for the visual outcome? And if it is present more to in the foveal area, will it have a better visual outcome? See, we got to treat them any ways. These are just fan fancy terms which you hear in the VR, I don't believe in most of them, but I think comprehensive ophthalmologists get intimidated by them. So I just include it to be familiar with them, yeah. but you got to treat them only you counsel the patients. Yeah. Thank you. Instead Thank you. of they breaking their head about all these fancy terms, they should know this terminology and what it could lead to when you, they find an OCT uh, in their clinic. That is more important here. Thank you for asking thank the you, questions and uh, now we will move on to Dr. Ajay Arora. Thank you, sir. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Maji, Dr. Kim, Dr. Shubhendu and Dr. Vishali and all of you present here. I am talking on lasers in diabetic retinopathy and DME management and recurrences. So, uh, Mark Twain was declared dead, but he was actually alive. And similarly, lasers too, by the pharmacotherapy group, they believe that lasers are dead, but they remain relevant, and I'll try to prove it, that lasers are still relevant. So what I'll be discussing will be the standard of ETDS protocol, the modified ETDS protocol, the minimal macular grid 
plan for focal laser for recurrences, use of subthreshold micropulse laser, use of laser beyond the equator for recurrent macular edema and recurrent vitreous hemorrhage in lasered PDR, what is the way forward? So, diabetic retinopathy study demonstrated the 50% reduction in the rate of severe visual loss in eyes that were treated with PRP and we are fortunate that this was one of the first multicenter trials ever to be done in the world. DRS recommended prompt treatment of eyes with high risk PDR. Subsequently, AT DRS from actually which the thought process of subthreshold micropulse started when they looked at the individual burns, showed that focal photocoagulation decreased the risk of moderate visual loss and reduced retinal thickening. It also showed that uh, we can consider scatter PRP in cases of severe NPDR. So this is a slide of uh, focal laser which I had done about 18 years back. Um, we were we had uh, courage enough to go as close to the phobia, but this should not be done. We I I lost this patient for the follow up, so I don't know whether these laser marks uh, and extended, uh, so they became larger. But yes, we did with a 50 micron spot with 100 millisecond power. We were treating the red, that is the focal hyperfluorescent spots after doing an angiogram and we did reduce the edema so that the laser was effective. Then came up the ETDRS protocol which showed that if within the 500 to 3000 micron we should we can laser but closer to 500 micron that is when the DRCA.net classification came up of a central involving diabetic macular edema and a non-central involving diabetic macular edema that uh, uh, these patients should be treated with pharmacotherapy. But then there is a confusion that if you have a center involving diabetic macular edema, you could actually have a lesion sitting way out within those 500 to 3000 micron, which can actually be treated with focal laser and hence the, hence the importance of doing an angiogram to, to find out from where the leak is occurring. So even if it is a center involving diabetic macular edema, but it is not being generated by within the center, but the leak is coming from elsewhere and those cases also can be laser as uh, this thing. This is just to show you the normal grid pattern because it's a course for comprehensive ophthalmologists. Just to show you that we stay about 1500, uh, 500 microns away from the disc and this area which is covered is from 500 to 3000 micron which can be uh, which can be treated and this is the, the modified grid which is uh, the C-shape and grid which we are using and uh, then we come to the, the focal laser, which we target the red lesions. We try to differentiate between hemorrhages and microaneurysms, and uh, they, they do well. And this is just an example of another patient who was treated by focal laser. And this is a period of a follow-up, which you can see that over a period of time, the patient responded well. Now, this is, uh, I would uh, ask you to uh, recommend that you should go through this paper, which is in uh, International Ophthalmic Clinics, which compares the direct uh, grid photocoagulation by the ETDS protocol, the modified ETDS protocol. The target here was to, to treat the microorganisms so that they change color. In a modified ETS protocol, you do not need to change the color. And in a mild macular grid, basically, you do not target the microorganism at all. A lot of people believe, so there the target is to, in, uh, to change the, the, uh, uh, the, the biochemical chemical changes which happen in the retinal pigment epithelium and which is the basis for subthreshold micropulse laser. Now, this is something which we had done long time back that in case there was a recurrence, we would go closer than 500 micron up to 300 micron and treat these patients and they did well. But the scars over the period of time extended. So these days, my uh, treatment protocol is that I do not go closer than 750 micron because I am not sure. And if I have to treat any uh, lesions there, I use a burn size of 50 micron with a, with a duration of 50 to 100 milliseconds. So this was a patient who had uh, extra foveal uh, macular edema. And we, we had an option of treating this patient with a focal laser. We went ahead and treated this patient with, uh, uh, with micropulse laser and the patient uh, did respond well. 
The other option, I this is I don't have uh, personal experience, but Dr. Vishali has used Navelas laser. But I think Navelas laser can be used for targeting these uh, lesions very close to the uh, foveal area, where you can actually pinpoint the lesions beforehand. You can overlay this with the OCT map, and then go ahead and treat these lesions very very accurately. This works as a documentation, both in the color and the angiography mode, and then you can compare the subsequent how the patient has responded, that is certainly an option available. Since this option is not available to us, we follow certain other techniques. And so this was a patient who had a persistent diabetic macular edema lasered and treated with anti vegf had received multiple anti vegf injections. And we went ahead and did an angiogram. And you can see here that this, the, the laser has not been done beyond the equator, which is usually the case. We miss out on the periphery and do not treat the periphery. And this patient was actually then treated by additional PRP beyond the periphery. And after having done that, patient did not require anti of injection. Just to prove that every macular edema need not be injected. If after the injection you're not getting an adequate response, it is advisable to do a wide field angiogram to find out if the periphery is has large areas of capillary non-perfusion. I'll show you some more patients where I have done this, show you the wide field angiograms where patients were having recurrent bleeds and they were treated with the laser for the capillary non-perfusion in the periphery and patient did well. So this is just to show you the patient is quiescent. Visual acuity has slightly improved. There is some persistent of the, these uh, cavities, but they are persistent and nothing much can be done about it. Now, this is a patient who had a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. We went ahead and did an angiogram. And if you see here, there is a small NV in the periphery. There is another NV. There are large areas of capillary non-perfusion. So this patient was vitrectomized, but he had recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. We did a fluid air exchange. After the fluid air exchange, once things settled down, we did an angiogram. And now the patient has been on my follow for almost about seven months, and patient has not bled. Another patient, you would think that there is so much laser has to be done, why should you do an angiogram? But the patient was having small bleeds. We did an angiogram and found out that there are um, uh, multiple NVs. So these need to be focally treated. So this is just to show you what a normal fundus camera sees and what a wide field angiography sees. So you can imagine that if I had done a normal fundus camera, I would, I would have definitely missed those leaks. When you do a wide field angiography, you will pinpoint these leaks and be able to treat these cases. Another patient who had uh, persistent macular edema, laser diabetic retinopathy, and had occasional small hemorrhages, we could find out large areas of capillary non-perfusion patient did well. I have a few patients. This is just one of them who is, uh, the entire family is diabetic. He has, so we told him that we'll do a micropulse PRP in these patients. Uh, we did a targeted uh, focal laser for the NV, did a micropulse PRP, and I now have a follow-up of two and a half years for this patient. We have repeated the micropulse PRP almost every six to eight months. Patient's field has been maintained. Patient has not had uh, uh, additional, uh, uh, he had once uh, NV was targeted, but has not had any hemorrhage. So by this technique, we feel that we may be able to maintain patient's field and yet, uh, and, and, and the macular edema could be, uh, could be avoided. So this is just a suggestion which we are trying to do. And maybe we should, once I have a larger number of patients, it will be better for me to analyze these patients well. So uh, to take home for the DME treatment, if you see here, what we do is that we do for the focal CSME, we try to tra treat the leaks beyond 750 micron as was done in this patient. Of course, all these patients must have a good metabolic control, must have a good lipid control. If you have a leaks coming central to 750 micron is better to treat them with an intravitreal anti-VEGF. It's also important to remember that if you can, so there are a lot of studies now coming up where actually you treat with laser after drying up the macula with an anti vegf because then it's believed that the irradiance of the laser burns is less, the burns can be more precise, and you can actually hit those lesions which you really want to hit. And these, by this way, we can avoid further damage to the macula center. So the take-home message is laser photocoagulation was relegated to the backyard with the advent of pharmacotherapy, but now with better understanding is making a comeback. PRP has remained effective for PDR over the last four decades and still is effective. Ultra-wide field angiography has helped in identifying 
um, uh, NVEs and CNP area. So in those cases where you have a recurrent bleed or you have uh, persistent uh, NVDs or, or macular edema, these uh, targeted therapy can be effective. But if you have a persistent NVD, then the best treatment option available is actually a pharmacotherapy, but then it has to be re-injected. Subthreshold micropulse laser may prove to be an effective way to treat DME. A larger study is required. We have a, I, I'm not put down my data here, but we have a few patients where subthreshold micropulse laser is working out well and we are able to reduce the number of injections which we have to give to patients. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Uh, are there any questions from the audience for Dr. Ajay Arora? Like, I have a question to, to Dr. Here. Oh, yeah. So, like, uh, in a case of refractory diabetic macular edema, what is your choice of treatment? You, will you go for the ultra wide field angiography followed by targeted retinal photoagulation to the retinal, uh, like peripheral uh, non partitioning area, or you will uh, go for the surgery? Detectomy with ILM peeling. So, um, I think uh, if I be permitted to answer, it would take two minutes. Uh, I would do a metabolic assessment. A lot of these patients, I have had a patient who had anemia. You treated this anemia and patient did well. I had a patient who has thalassemia. You are able to manage. So those patients with thalassemia, vitrectomy worked. But in these cases of persistent macular edema, what I found best working in my hands is a supracoloral triamcinolone. If that doesn't work, if that doesn't work and the edema, because there the effect lasts for almost about seven to eight months. If that doesn't work and, uh, uh, you know, so these patients may not have an obvious traction, but when you do a vitrectomy, you do two things. There's some amount of traction which causes the vitreous which is there. Be, also, be the oxygenation of the macula improves after vitrectomy. Yes, I think that works. Yeah, uh, what he pointed out is that we should, whenever there is a chronic cases, you know, it's always better to assess the systems and normalize them. At the same time, if uh, the periphery non-ischemia is there, targeted laser is the second, uh, best option. If these two are ruled out, then the injections are detectable. Um, can I have the slide for Dr. Rajiv Raman? Uh, actually, Dr. Rajiv Raman is supposed to come, but his father was not well, so he has sent his slides and I will be sharing the slides. The gist of the slides I will tell you so that we will not miss the subject matter of this talk. So uh, the two components are there. One is diabetic macular edema, second is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. If you see the diabetic macular edema, you should be like an eagle. Diabetic macular edema, how to manage? And first of all, you classify whether it is uh, what type of diabetic mac maculopathy you are dealing with. We have told you several types in my talk. So here it is mainly the edema part, whether it is center involving or center sparing. Center spa sparing, the management is different. Then the systemic uh, parameters should always be assessed as a general ophthalmologist as a, uh, or as a retina specialist. And then you consider which injectables or the laser which are uh, mainly you give as a treatment. So once you decided that anti age of injections, then you need to see what type of uh, diabetic macular edema, whether it is a good response or not good response, what is the vision the patient is having, and what are the OCT findings. So this is very, very important, and uh, when there is an obvious traction, the answer is vitrectomy, not any injections or the systemic parameters. Now, if you have ruled out other ischemic and traction, then you should assess your, for injections, then you should assess that, what is the vision? In this, if the vision is 2025 or better, it was told that observation is better than even committing for injections. This one need to very well understand. The second is when the vision is less than 2030, then you need to identify the diabetic macular edema, which type of the patient we are dealing with, which is good responder, intermediate responder or non-responder. And depending upon that, you need to 
select the anti-VEGF agents. Then if you see the other uh, factors, here CVA, the cardiovascular uh, accidents and cerebrovascular accidents and then cardiac also, then probably you may have to avoid anti-VEGF and go for steroids. DMA during pregnancy, again, each trimester has its impact on the management of diabetic macular edema. Early, probably, you may have more uh, laser and uh, the injections, maybe, but with the caution, not anti-VGF steroids can be given. Late pregnancy, certain times, it's better to wait for treatment. And once the delivery, probably, it may improve by itself. Then comes is the poor compliance, which is very, very dangerous when you are committing for injections. So you should always ensure that good follow-up is required. And if you see the CKD, which uh, the question uh, Nilatal has asked, in these cases when anti is probably you may have to suspend it temporarily or if it is not possible, commit for steroids in these cases. Then I related it can be either uh, vitectomized dyes, then again the absorption of anti will be very fast. So it's go for a long acting and implants are better in these cases. Then DME with PDR, definitely it was anti which you can opt for. And pseudophagic eyes always, you should identify CME or DME. This identification should be done before you commit for the management. So now uh, comes is the disease-related factors, especially uh, uh, Dr. Vishali has uh, very briefly touched upon the plaque hard exudates in the macular area. When you are seeing this, certain times lasers can be detrimental in these cases. So you should uh, go for one dyslipidemics or intravital steroids and then maybe adjuvant lipid lowering agents in these cases. And when uh, there is a poor vision and thicker retina, then injections, traction is there, surgery is the answer for these cases. Then different management strategies and studies are available, but uh, the newer agents like brolucizumab and forcimab can uh, clarify to an extent because these are long-acting anti vgf agents which may help in um, diabetic macular edema management. Then the second component of uh, the presentation is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Again, the, we always think that proliferative has a clear answer, but not so in all uh, cases. And especially when you, you see the long-term outcomes, it's very tricky. You can see in over 19 years, these patients, almost half of them are retaining good vision, like 40% with 2020 are better vision, and 84% uh, almost retaining 2040. Means it is not so urgent in the management of proliferative diabetic retinopathy in diabetics. And the vision loss also in uh, different studies, it has shown uh, different thing, but more uh, you should be concentrating on not only laser, but the cataract component. You can see the uh, extent of cataract surgery is almost 50% of the patients are having that. And VR surgery also, almost quarter of the patients requiring VR surgery in proliferative diabetic retinopathies. So, in PDR, laser or injections, what is the benefits of each modality, whether better anatomical outcome which is coming with it, this modality or a better functional outcome or a less adverse effects with each modality or less uh, complications or more economical. These components, if you see from laser to injections, what is the studies are saying? These are not shown great advantage to injections compared to lasers in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So we should tend for more no for injections in proliferative diabetic retinopathy where there is a limited role for anti -vagers. Whereas diabetic macular edema is totally different scenario where if you uh, rule out the ischemia and traction, 
the injections may play a major role and a focal diabetic macular edema can be treated with laser. So uh, there are uh, some supportive studies, but main important when you are committing for anti-VGFs is uh, that uh, your uh, follow-up should be very good. And what happens if you have given anti-VGF and this patient is lost to follow-up? Again, a dangerous outcome, which can be a, uh, in terms of poor visual outcome or in terms of worsening of the disease process, which is very, very dangerous. One should be very careful. And in very rare cases, there can be a nevascular glaucoma, means the vision is lost forever in these cases. Thank you, Rajiv, for this presentation. I would not thank myself because the whole uh, subject and the knowledge is from Dr. Rajiv Raman and I wish his father recovers very quickly. Any questions uh, for Rajiv's topic, I am happy to answer. Niluptal, did you get your answer? Niluptal is there or not? He asked the question. Yeah, please come forward. And are there any questions for... Uh, this topic for Rajiv Raman and uh, Dr. Yeah, Nilantha. if I understood correctly, that <coughs> steroids is the primary yeah, is the option. Yeah. But if you take the systems well taken care, because advanced nephropathies certain times it do not respond so easily. So treatment is very very difficult. Rather than saying that this is the option. Yeah, I mean, uh, these are very non-compliant -compli patients, so uh, maybe steroid is the answer. But however, yeah. if their pati patients are fakeek. In those uh, cases, anti-VGF can also be given, but uh, uh, with long duration gaps. Okay. Because uh, it can affect the nephropathy status. Exactly. I had another question uh, that, that was not answered. For you personally, what anti-VGF would you prefer in these cases? Uh, Dr. Kim. No, no, you you meant in these cases where there is uh, recurrent edema, not responding to treatment. Is that yes. was that your question? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, to make yeah. the long story short, it is personal preference, but we will we should be uh, committing for a long duration anti vgf even if it is given. Okay. Rather than shorter durations, I will not go into the brand names. Okay. 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 Uh, with that, um, I will uh, we end this talk and then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, thank yeah, you. I think Venkatesh has one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, is any amount of fluid tolerable in DME? Because in AMD, we say that some amount of subretinal fluid can be tolerable. So, in DME, is any amount of fluid tolerable? I think DME, the anti of injection, is not an urgency. CNVM, the anti of injection is an urgency. So therefore, uh, that's what that, if there's some amount of fluid, I don't think there are any studies which show that so much fluid you can tolerate, but uh, would be. Yeah. Uh, I uh, think you don't which? want uh, bone dry retina in DME because many a times when you make it too dry, all the hard exudates come and sit in the fovea. So little bit yeah. can be tolerated. And one question to you, Dr. Ajay, is that uh, is there any role of micropulse laser in center involving DME? Yeah, so in center involving DME, I am doing uh, micropulse laser transphobia. And, uh, uh, you know, that data is still not fully collated. I will definitely show you these patients, the number of injections which we can reduce, the risk of giving an intravitreal injection and all the consequences of intravitreal injection get reduced. And uh, it seems to be of some use. The micropulse laser is not a, a so, so treatment for this. It's only an adjective treatment and it cannot be the only one. And now the treatment parameters for micropulse are getting a little changed because Jay has reported we are now doing with a 10% rather than a 5% duty cycle. So uh, it's mainly in AMD, but the fluid should be very dry, but not in diabetic macular edema. And lasers, especially sub-threshold lasers, may be considered when center is involved. However, the risks of uh, the plaque formation with hard exudates is very, very dangerous. And uh, we have seen the good vision has going down 
with block formation that need to be considered. And we will quickly move on to the next talk. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Maji. Uh, thank you, Dr. So, Maji. Subendu Boral. Yes. He will be talking about the surgical intervention in diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. After, after all Subhendu. the crucial uh, management uh, protocols for uh, medical management of diabetic retinopathy, I am coming to the surgical uh, options. The main problem with diabetic retinopathy, these are the two factors, the cascade of events that uh, occurs due to the progressive vitreous contraction that leads to anomalous PVD and finally vitreous macular interface disorder. A second thing is the membrane proliferation at the proliferative stage, that is the fibrovascular either recent or old fibrous traction traction and cause traction and elevation of the vascular epicenters, traction and retinal detachments and regma formation at the base of the vas vascular epicenters. So uh, the, uh, that leads to combined retinal and detachment. So no, non enzymatic glycation of the vitreous proteins and the vitreous degeneration leads to anomalous PVD and uh, that is uh, like with visible traction where you can identify the, uh, this, this, this traction. You can do the OCT, you can see the vitreous macular radiation and uh, the occipital sclerosis jetria has the very limited role. So I have gone for uh, with the, this 24 gauge needle to identify the uh, after identifying the posterior highlight phase and made the opening and elevated the highlight phase with this. Uh, cutter uh, followed by cutter and completion of vitectomy and posterior you can see the complete absence of uh, symptomatic vitromacular traction. Now coming to the more severe uh, interface disorder that is the uh, taut posterior highlight phase with multiple VMT where I identified with the uh, trans acetonide crystals and then used Bain 24 gauge needle to make a nick and uh, remove all the uh, this uh, tra tractional this uh, highlight membrane and finally with the forcep you can remove the membranes. Third thing, uh, third option is you can uh, see the dramatic taut uh, highlight phase with broad based vitreo traction. You can three, uh, do the three dimensional OCT to see the exact point of traction. It is at the fovea. So I identified this uh, membrane and used Bain 24 gauge needle to give a nick to the posterior highlight phase and made an opening. And with the help of this uh, uh, this visco uh, visco uh, visco dissection, I just released the posterior highlight traction from the underlying fovea. That means the fovea lateral which is broad based VMT, it is difficult to, uh, to remove the, this membrane, you can injure the fovea. So after, after releasing the membranes from the foveal attachment, you can just do the uh, removal of uh, uh, the, the uh, highlight phase and posteriorly see the good OCT. And it is another case where you can get the multiple traction uh, and elevation. I identified the posterior highlight fade with the traction, uh, these trans acetonide crystals and uh, went out with this bent 24 gauge needle and I didn't uh, and make that open need uh, and use the bent cannula that is with the visco dissection with uh, attaching this bent uh, cannula with this our routine VFC and using this visco dissection, releasing the highlight phase traction from the underlying foveal edema. Sure. Can you speak to into the microphone? Yes. It is a little bit confusing for people to hear. Okay. Now completion of vitrectomy. This another thing is diabetic mac uh, ERM where you can see the, the attachment is very firmly attached and you can do the stain the ILM, uh, the uh, ERM with the help of type and blue followed by ILM. And when you remove the IL, uh, ERM, you can um, sometimes you remove the ILM also, and finally uh, you can get good result like o in OCT. Another uh, very tricky situation we can do the fibrous, uh, uh, fibrous uh, this ERM, and it is very creating the central fibrosis kind of picture. So, uh, so after removal this mem uh, of this membrane, is, it, it is very tricky to remove this fibrous uh, elevation with the gentle uh, traction with the help of cutter only you can see. And uh, sometimes uh, it, it is associated with the um, uh, PFT that is big bends, uh, the very atypical kind of situation where I used first initially with proportional reflux followed by again visco dissection and finally uh, uh, dynamically uh, perform the visco dissection removal uh, uh, separation of this highlight phase from the elevated fovea with this uh, injecting the viscous tissue under the highlight phase. And another thing is uh, sometimes uh, 
recalcitrant diabetic macroridema that I am coming with uh, like without visible traction where in the OCT any visible traction is not uh, like it is uh, visible in on OCT. So here uh, identify all the tractional elements like vitreous kysis, removal of vitreous kysis, removal of uh, ERM and finally uh, the ILM. So uh, another coming to the PDR part, that is the various techniques in managing diabetic membranes, where you can uh, you have uh, multiple options like forceps filling, chopstick filling, and you come to one by one. That is the forcep filling with the help of forcep, you are removing the membranes. There is a small localized membrane where you can peel the membrane with the help of forcep. Now sometimes these membranes can be it is very thumbly adhered. So I am using uh, with the help of the light pipe, that is the chopstick peeling, and just remove all. The the traction with the help of cutter only. Now another uh, thing is when you see the tractional elevation from all around the macula, you stabilize the macula with the PFCL and use the uh, cutter to lift up the membrane. But in this type of cases, you should be very cautious because you may create break like in this case. Here peripherally, although it is not involved in the macula, but it should uh, always try to avoid the macular break formation and remove all the uh, membranes. And this is another uh, delamination technique, this is lift and cut, cut, lift the membrane and then cut. That is the one of the best part. Another thing is fold back delamination that uh, already, uh, that first initially ex explained by Dr. Steve Charles. When the margin of the membrane is get free from the underlying retinal additions, you can use the uh, cutter to when the, when the membrane can be easily uh, pulled back to the cutter opening. Another is conformal delamination. That is another technique where you, the membrane can cut. Uh, it is a little bit more additions were there. Sometimes proportional reflux helps after creating the the uh, a small leak in the retinal uh, in the posterior hyaluronic phase. Try to insulate the cutter under the posterior hyaluronic phase and try, uh, activate. Your proportional reflux mode, like in this case of um, complex uh, vitreous macular additions with PFT, I have already described. So, it's a visco dissection. I was telling in my previous slide that visco dissection is another favor. Uh, favor, uh, it is. I, I'm very much in favor of visco dissection. Like, well, while all the additions are not coming with the uh, with the all your usual maneuvers, try to insinuate this curved cannula and inject the visco elastics to in this like in this case where you can separate the all the uh, very firm additions from underneath the retina where the proportional reflex will not work. So visco dissection along with this bimanual ma maneuver, uh, these are all helpful in comp dealing the all complex uh, maneuvers like uh, removal of all the membranes safely uh, without creating any unnecessary break. So uh, bimanual vitrectomy, I am uh, also very strong uh, proponent of this bi bimanual vitrectomy under the sand glass light where you can deal the, all the membranes without cre creating all the unnecessary breaks, you can use all the complex, uh, uh, you can do uh, curved scissors also to cut the membranes slowly, slowly and uh, sometimes this with the help of cutter also, you can re remove the membrane one by one without cre creating unnecessary breaks. Now coming to the like uh, first step should be the ski step like in this case where I am going for the inside out delamination where that's just lift up the membrane slowly slowly gently without creating any break and remove the membrane. So this is the inside out delamination where and in, this is the outside in delamination. Uh, I am in very much favor of outside in delamination rather than the inside out delamination in most of my cases because the membrane sometimes is very deep, often very very deep, uh, it is firmly attached to the macula. So if you cut the vitreous phase as well as the hyaluronic phase from the outside and then go slowly inside, so your macular part is can it will be last part to uh, to deal with and just see in this case where I am just removing all the vitreous part, uh, uh, the hyaluronic phase from outside and slowly I can realize that macula is just marginally involved and with the gentle traction of the cutter only you can just remove the membrane slowly slowly and finally your direction of the pool should be always from the disc to the center so the uh, just to avoid the unnecessary uh, retinal break formation so 
This is another case where, uh, like you can see, very complex combined retinal and detachment where I am just removing all the hyalur phase fibrous membrane. Vascularity complex was very much less because we have injected preoperatively uh, anti VEGF injection. I tried to separate it with the help of cutter only and using the proportional reflux mode. I am just separating the underlying detached thin retina and uh, and separating the this fibrous membrane from the underlying this thin retina and slowly slowly I am just uh, removing all the uh, vitreous all the hyaluronic membrane without creating any break. Try to avoid any break formation in this complex case where I found subretinal band also. So I have to remove the subretinal band to make the retina uh, relax and uh, traction free. So this underlying subretinal band and over the membrane uh, that is what the retina you can see the vitreous, uh, mem vitreous kysis membranes. Here I made one small retinotomy to remove the subretinal tractional band and the subretinal tractional band has to be removed to make make the retina as mobile as possible freely uh, and by manually under the sandless light this kind of maneuver it is very much necessary uh, to make the retina absolutely traction free yeah. and very 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 gently you should do it not to create any uh, another way. now the see the retina is absolutely relaxed and just very much mobile so that the, your retina you will not get re-detached re re after uh, surgery another it is you may face some atypical think, kind of situation uh, so yes where there is combination of uh, PDR and, and the macular hole where after removing all the vitreous traction and membrane removal, I, uh, I uh, injected PFCL bubble to settle the posterior pole and did sub PFCL ILM peeling and uh, in an in inverted peel manner and, uh, and uh, made the uh, macular hole closed under the PFCL and I finally removed the PFCL and injected uh, silicon oil at the end of surgery. So uh, another tricky situation is, is papillary vitreal NVD, very angry looking, just like a flower. You can just uh, peel the, all this, uh, this, this membrane with the help of forceps. The part will be just, uh, will be just uh, that the detached retina was there and you can slowly, slowly remove this membrane and finally made the retina absolutely membrane free. So the main goal of PDR, it is to stop all the source of bleeding and try to preserve the macula to keep uh, macula free of break. And roll of silicon oil, it, is, it has very low oxygen uh, extraction ratio and silicon oil increases retinal schema. These are all like doubtful silicon, roll of silicon is very yeah, much yeah. doubtful although you are using it prevent anti yeah, yeah. agents from diffusing. I think okay. we are uh, stepping thank into you. the next session. Uh, I, I thank you, Subendu, and uh, we are concluding this session, and I thank all the speakers and uh, all the delegates uh, for their uh, contributions, as well as I uh, hope that uh, this uh, the instruction course was useful for the delegates who attended. Thank you all.